not. Here we go. Okay, cults, heresies, false doctrines, Jehovah's Witnesses, second lesson on this cult. And last time we talked about the history of the Jehovah's Witnesses and the movement, how it started, Charles Taze Russell, and their obsession with date setting and always getting those dates wrong. And so now we'll come to the um, lesson where we'll talk about their doctrine. What do they believe? What do they teach? Well, what do they hold to? Why do they believe those things? And the biblical answer for those things. There's too many really to probably talk about all in one lesson. We'll talk about some of the main ones, some of the big ones, some of the most important ones that you probably run into more than others. And we'll go through the Bible verses refuting them or showing why they believe them and what it actually means. And then we've got a number of the one of beliefs at the end that we'll just kind of touch upon quickly. Just so you won't be oblivious if you ever hear anybody refer to them. So to begin, let's talk about God's name. God's name. You know Jehovah's Witnesses. They're called Jehovah's Witnesses um, because they make a very, very, uh, make it a focal point that they don't call God by any name but Jehovah. That's his name according to Jehovah's Witnesses. <clears throat> we can start by pointing out the fact that this is a name of God that is used four times in the Scripture. It's Exodus 6 and verse 3, Psalm 83 and verse 18, Isaiah 12 and verse 2, and Isaiah 26, 4. That's Exodus 6, 3, Psalm 83, 18, Isaiah 12, 2, Isaiah 26, 4. So it is a name of God. We're not arguing that it's not a name of God and it's a perfectly acceptable name of God. And if you want to refer to God as Jehovah, I really don't ultimately have an issue with that. However, Jehovah's Witnesses have decided that this is God's only name and that your King James Bible is incorrect for calling him Lord. Here's how it all got started. Go to Deuteronomy chapter number 6. Deuteronomy chapter number 6. Deuteronomy 6. Look down at verse number 16. Not tempt the Lord, your God, as he tempted him in Mesa, or Massa. Look at that word Lord. You should not tempt the Lord, your God. You know something funny about that word, maybe different about that word, maybe you've always seen it and wondered. Lord is in all capital letters. Your Bible show it that way. King James, if you've got a King James Bible, it does. L O R D, capitalized, and then in a slightly different, uh, distinct font. Why is this? Well, in the original Hebrew text, okay, we're getting, getting way out there. There's a funny word spelled Y H W H or J H W H. So when you're coming in your Bible, if you're reading in Hebrew and you come to this word and it's Y-H-W-H-J-H-W-H, try to pronounce that. <laughs> Y-H-W-H-J-H-W-H, good luck. This is called the Tetragrammaton. T-E-T-R-A-G-R-A-M-M-A-T-O-N. Tetragrammaton. Okay, there's a lots of uh, controversy surrounding on how this should be pronounced or translated. This YHWHJHWH is where you get your Yahweh. You get these groups saying that, oh, you know, God's name is actually Yahweh. And they, that's where they get that is that YHWH. And since it can't be pronounced, they add some vowels in. Um, same thing with JHWH. That's where they come up with, with Jehovah. And it is translated that in a few times in the King James Bible, but mostly the King James translators rendered it as LORD, all caps, but so you would know that it came from this tetragrammaton, they put it in all capital letters. So they came to this word, they said there's no English equivalent, there's no way to pronounce it, there's no vowels, it's a very, very funny, very distinct word for the name of God, and so they said the way that we're going to translate it is every time we come to this tetragrammaton, we're going to render it LORD. But we're going to put it in all capital letters, so in our honesty, the readers will know that this was translated from that YHWH, from that tetragrammaton. So not a very, 
you know, deep sort of um, issue. That's how the King James translator rendered it, and we're about to see that it's the correct translation. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that it should have been rendered Jehovah. So anywhere that your Bible has that capital Lord, they think that it should have been rendered Jehovah. Now, it turns out that there is a way to find out the correct translation. Hold Deuteronomy 6 in one hand, and with the other, go to Matthew chapter number 4. Matthew chapter number 4. Should it have been Jehovah? Should it have been Lord? Should it have been left alone? What's the proper translation? Well, the Bible tells us. Look at Matthew chapter number 4. In Matthew chapter number 4, Jesus is going to quote from Deuteronomy chapter number 6. And if you know just a little bit about Bible translation, your Old Testament was translated mostly from Hebrew. Your New Testament was translated mostly from. So we got two different texts, both inspired by God, two different languages. Old Testament uses YHWH translated, rendered, Lord, capital letters. Now we're going to come to a New Testament quotation of that same passage, and the Greek, well, let's see how the Greek puts it. Look at Matthew 4 and verse number 7. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, quotation from Deuteronomy 6, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Normal Lord, not all caps, not special font. You know why? Because Lord was the proper translation in Deuteronomy chapter 6. In, in the New Testament, when Jesus Christ, Christ is quoting the Old Testament, he uses the word Lord. So we know that this is an accurate translation and accurate rendering of that tetragrammaton is Lord. So, really, everywhere the Bible says Jehovah in the New World Translation, which is the Jehovah's Witness Bible, more accurately it would be translated Lord. Not only that, but it is incorrect according to the Scriptures to say that God's only name is Jehovah. God has multiple names, actually, according to the Scriptures, and we will look at those right now. Number one, come to Exodus chapter 34. Exodus 34. And verse number 14, Exodus 34, 14. For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Capital J, Jealous, his name is Jealous. So Jealous is a name for God in the Bible. Um, come to Psalm number 2, Psalm 68. Psalm 68. Psalm 68 and verse number 4. Says, Sing unto God, sing praises to his name. Extol him that rideth upon the heavens by his name, Jah. And rejoice before him. So Jah in the Bible is a name for God. J-A-H. That is distinct and different from Jehovah. So J-A-H, Psalm 864, uh, is a name for God. Judge is a name for God. Number four. Oh, I'm sorry, number three. Let's not skip three. Holy. Holy. Look at Isaiah 57. Isaiah 57. Isaiah 57. Verse number 15. Isaiah 57, 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is Holy, capital H, a holy place, with him also that is a, uh, of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and revive the heart of the contrite one. So God's name is Holy, according to Isaiah 57. Number four, he is called Judge. Look at Judges 11. Judges chapter number 11 and verse number 27. Judges eleven twenty-seven. Wherefore have I not sinned against thee, but thou doest me wrong to war against me? The Lord, the judge, be judged this day between the children of Israel and children of Ammon. Also Genesis eighteen fifteen says, Shall not the judge 
of all the earth do right. Capitalized, giving us a, at least a strong indication that this is a name for God. The Lord of hosts, Amos, the book of Amos. Amos chapter number 5. And verse number 27. This is a very convincing one. Therefore will I cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, saith the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. So, what Jehovah's Witnesses will say is that's not a name, that's a title. All of these will say they're a title. But this specifically says that his name is the God of hosts. And of course, in Revelation 19, number 6 and last, he is referred to as faithful, true, and the word of God. The Bible says, And I saw heaven open, behold, a white horse. Obviously, this assumes that Jesus Christ is God, which the Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe. We'll talk about that momentarily. But, um, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and his head, on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. He was clothed in a vesture dipped in blood, and it's called the Word of God. So faithful, true, and the Word of God. Let's look at a, a contradiction in the New World Translation concerning the name of God. The New World Translation is the Jehovah's Witnesses um, rendering of the scriptures. It was translated um, by multiple people, none of which who had any credentials or any sort of um, scholarship in biblical Greek or the ability to, to really uh, translate the Word of God. And it was it was strictly a denominational translation. It was it was a, a denomination translating the Bible to fit their purposes and fit their beliefs. That's why you come to John chapter number 1, and it talks about, and the word was a God in the New World Translation instead of the word was God. Just, just, trying, to, just trying to change the uh, Bible to fit their, their belief. But let's look at a contradiction. Come to Exodus chapter number 6. Exodus 6. Exodus 6, verse number 3. And I appeared, okay, think, think about this carefully as we read it. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But my name Jehovah, but by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. So first off, you've got something that seems to contradict their religion. He says that I was made, I knew, they knew me by my name, God Almighty. He said, but by my name, Jehovah, I was not known unto them. Okay? Look at Genesis chapter 15. Hold Exodus, look at Genesis 15. Look at verse number 7. And he said unto them, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. Who is he talking to? He's talking to Abraham. The Jehovah's Witness Bible, New World Translation, renders verse number 7 as, I am Jehovah. When Exodus 6 and verse 3 just said that Abraham did not know God by his name Jehovah. So what that creates is a contradiction in the New World Translation. So... Yet another reason to believe that their idea that there's only one name of God and it has to be Jehovah or that that rendering should have been Jehovah is, is definitely incorrect. Okay, let's talk about Jesus Christ according to Jehovah's Witnesses. Let's talk about Jesus. Here's a direct quote from JW.org. We follow the teachings and example of Jesus Christ and honor him as our Savior and as the Son of God. Thus, we are Christians. However, we have learned from the Bible that Jesus is not Almighty God, and that there is no scriptural basis for the Trinity doctrine. We have spent plenty of time, end quote, this is now us, we have spent plenty of time in other classes proving that the Bible clearly teaches that Jesus is God, and there is an overwhelming amount of evidence showing that the Trinity is a biblical doctrine, not a church tradition. The Bible says 
there's the, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. That's not that's not church tradition. That's just what the Bible says. Um, so there is evidence for the Trinity, and there is overwhelming evidence to show that Jesus is equal with God. We won't go through every single one of those points because we've done it before. If you want that information, I can easily get you lots of information on the subject. But we will look a couple a couple particular areas that are tend to be a focal point for the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. So, number one, Jesus is the Son of God. Often when you talk to Jehovah's Witnesses and you say Jesus is God, their response will be, well, no, he's the Son of God. And they think because there's a distinction there, because he's specifically referred to as the Son, then he must be lesser than the Father. And it's just not the case. Um, we know that Jesus is called the Son of God throughout the Scriptures, so when you say that Christ is God, they respond with, He's the Son of God. We cannot deny, nor do we desire to deny, the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. The question is, does the fact that He is the Son of God mean that He isn't God? Well, no. 1 John 5, 7 says that there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So according to the Scriptures, the distinction between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost does not negate the fact that they are all God because of the fact that they are all one. The Father is called the Father. That doesn't mean he's not God. Right? The Holy Ghost is called the Holy Ghost. That doesn't mean he's not God. Just because the Son doesn't mean he's, he's not God. They are distinct. They are given that distinction. There's no evidence in the Scripture for a trinity, and yet we've got these verses that talk. They just can't seem to understand how the Son could be God and still the Son. Well, because of the trinity that you deny John 14 and verse 8, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? And then John 5, 17, verse 18, this is a very important verse of Scripture. Jesus answered them, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. When Jesus Christ claimed to be the Son of God, he was not claiming to be lesser than God, he was claiming to be equal with God. When Christ came and said, I am the Son of God, the Jews understood him to be, correctly understood him to be claiming to be equal with God. That is why they crucified him, ultimately, was their reason, was because he said that he was the Son of God. So from these verses, we clearly see that the fact that he is called the Son does not rob him of deity in the same way that the fact that the Father is called the Father does not rob him of deity. Okay, so that's number one. They say Jesus is the Son of God. It's true. He is the Son of God. Irrelevant conversation. It does not rob him of his deity. Number two, Jesus is a created being. Jehovah's Witnesses stand hard on the idea that Jesus Christ was a created being by God and therefore he cannot be God. They come to this conclusion based on a few misinterpreted scriptures. Come to Colossians chapter number 1. Look at these because these are important. Come to Colossians chapter number 1. Look at verse number 15. Colossians 1, 15. Who is the image of the invisible God? The firstborn of every creature. The firstborn of every creature. So, people think, Jehovah Witnesses think, that since he's the firstborn of every creature, that that is saying that he is created by God. That he, they believe he was the first creation of every creature. There are a number of reasons why this is not speaking of Jesus being a created being, however. Firstly, the next verse immediately proves that he is the creator and proves his deity. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether it be thrones or dominions, or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he's before all things and by him all things consist. Genesis says God created the heavens and the earth. Colossians says Jesus created all things, meaning Jesus Christ is God. He's the word. Uh, God used his word to create the heavens and the earth. So the next verse proves his deity. Um, and then there is the actual definition of firstborn. The Jehovah's Witness will submit that Jesus was the firstborn, then he must be the first created, uh, created, which is a leap in logic because born does not mean the same thing as created. 
especially when you study the phrase firstborn in the Bible. It is unreasonable to say, since the Bible says he's the firstborn of every creature, that must mean that he's the first creator, created being, or that he was somehow created at all. The first question is, does God, ha- does God having a firstborn appear anywhere else in the Bible? And the answer is yes. Look at Psalm 89. Psalm 89. Psalm 89, look at verse number 27. And I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. This is speaking of King David. David is spoken of as God's firstborn. Jeremiah 31, 9. I'll just give you the reference because we're running out of time. Jeremiah 31, 9. Ephraim is referred to as God's firstborn. Now let me ask you a question. How many firstborns does a person have? Just one. You can only have one firstborn. Well, these are three different things that are referred to as God's firstborn. Jesus is referred to as his firstborn. David is referred to as his firstborn. Ephraim is referred to as his firstborn. In all three situations, it's not talking about creation. It's talking about position. David was given an exalted position over other people. And so he was referred to as God's firstborn. Ephraim was given an exalted position amongst the other tribes. And so he was referred to as God's firstborn. And Jesus Christ, in his humanity, in reference to the people that he lived with, was given an exalted position. Right? He was the man, Christ Jesus. We don't deny his humanity. 100% God, 100% man is the best way that we can try to put it into words. We don't deny his humanity. And in his humanity, he is given the firstborn position. He's given the highest position. So it's not talking about creation. It's talking about an exalted position because of those other passages that use the word firstborn in that sense. Now there's Hebrews 1. Come to Hebrews 1. There's another one they use. Hebrews chapter number 1. Look at verse number 4. Being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, Let all the angels of God worship him. So this day I have begotten thee, the first begotten into the world. They say that that means that Jesus Christ was created. Let's examine the scriptures. Again, the context proves that Jesus is God. It's funny when they'll take you to a verse to try to prove to you that Jesus isn't God. And then you can use that same verse to show them that Jesus Christ is God. Look at verse number 6, verse 7. And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a uh, flame of fire... But unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. So Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 8 calls the Son God. Can't get around that. Verse number 6 tells the angels of God to worship the Son. Nowhere else in the Bible is anyone commanded to worship anyone but God. So the context of this verse proves the deity of Jesus Christ. Begotten. The word begotten is never used for created. Nowhere in the Bible is the term begotten used for created. The closest that you could come is when the Bible says that Adam is the son of God, but that's speaking of his origin and not his position. So the word begotten is never used for a created being. Begotten is often used to denote position. And this is the meaning of the verse. The man Christ Jesus in his humanity was given an exalted position and this is the... is the only begotten of the Father. You're in Hebrews. Look at Hebrews 11. I will prove this to you. Look at Hebrews 11. How many sons did Abraham have? How many sons did Abraham have? 
at least two, right? I mean, we know we know Abraham had uh, 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 Ishmael and he had a son Isaac, and then after Sarah died, he he actually had more children. Look what the Bible says in Hebrews 11 and verse number 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Isaac was not Abraham's only son. He was his only begotten son. He was the son of promise. He had multiple sons, but he was the special one. He was the begotten one. He was the one with the position, the one through whom God would would multiply the seed of Abraham to be a blessing to all the world. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The modern versions take out the word begotten and say that God gave his only son, which is a problem because when you go to John chapter number 1, it says, to them that received him gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. When I believed on Jesus Christ, I became a son of God. So Jesus Christ is not God's only son. Jesus Christ is God's only begotten son, meaning that he has a special position. So Hebrews 11, and it's obvious when you, I mean Hebrews chapter 1, when you read the passage in Hebrews 1 in that light, It's talking about the fact that Jesus Christ is exalted. Jesus Christ holds this special position. It's not talking about him being created. It's talking about him being uh, in this this elevated position. So, and then number three. Number three, Job's witnesses believe that Jesus is inferior to the Father. This is another kind of angle they'll take often. The Job's witnesses say that the Bible shows Jesus Christ as being inferior to the Father, and therefore he cannot be God. Um, let me read you these few verses that seem to teach something like this. Romans, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure where Romans came from. John 14 and 28. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye loved me, you would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. So Jesus speaking says, my Father is greater than I. And they say that's proof that he's not God. Interesting. But we'll show you we'll show you what it means in a second here. John twenty and verse seventeen, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. So Jesus Christ calls God his God. How can God be God's God? It must be a contradiction. Well, no, it's not. 1 Corinthians 15, 28. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. See there? Jesus Christ will be subject to God. So that means that he's lesser than God, that he he obviously can't be God because he's lesser than God. So Jehovah's Witnesses look at these verses and say, because Jesus is in a lower position, he must be unequal to God. The problem is, There are many verses that say that the Father and the Son are equal. John 10.30 says, I and my Father are one. John 14.9, we already read, he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. 1 John 5.7 says that the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost uh, bear record in heaven, and that these three are one. Now, let's look at Philippians 2. This passage makes all of this make sense. Philippians 2, this is perhaps one of the most useful passages in all the Bible, for witnessing to somebody who doesn't believe Jesus Christ is God. Because I've had them, I've given them this verse, and they, they, there's nothing that they can say about it. There's nothing they can say to it. Look at Philippians 2 and verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Jesus Christ, in the flesh thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Jesus said, I am equal with God, and that's not robbery, that's not a bad thing. If I were to, I'm not, I'm not. But if I were to stand here tonight and say, I'm equal with God, would that be robbery? Please, yes, it would. Would that be a bad thing? Would that be a, a, a blasphemous thing? Absolutely. Jesus Christ said, I can call myself, not me, Jesus said of himself that he could call himself equal to God, and it wouldn't be robbery. It wasn't a bad thing. It wasn't a blasphemous thing. So what are you going to say to that? 
and they don't. They say, oh, well, oh, what about, what about, what about? Okay, so it establishes, Philippians 2, that Jesus Christ is equal with God. Verse number 7. That basically, in the out- offset, Paul says, I want you to, before we talk about any of this other stuff, I want you to know that he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now, verse 7, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. What happened? Jesus Christ is equal with God and thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but being in his humanity, he submitted himself to God. Not because he's lesser, not because he's not equal, but because he willingly and voluntarily took that lower, in a sense, position and submitted himself to the will of the Father so he could die and be a sacrifice for our sins. Jesus' submission to the Father does not make him unequal with the Father. Okay? That's what Jehovah's wants to say. Well, see, he submitted to the Father, so he must not be equal. Let me ask you a question. Does the wife submit herself to her husband biblically? Well, yes. The wife is supposed to submit herself to her own husbands, according to the Bible. Does that mean that they're not equal? No, absolutely not. The husband and the wife are very much equal. They're both humans. They're both souls. There's an equality there. But one is to take that, in a sense, lower position. Does not make her less of a human, does not make her less of a person or deserving of less respect or of less uh, a care. But she takes that lower position. That's a good, good angle to take because they'll agree the wife's supposed to be in submission to the husband and then quickly disagree if you say, well, then that means that they're not equal. Um, so that's a good, good angle to take. So Philippians 2, great solution in any situation, especially this one. Okay, let's talk about earth, heaven, and the 144,000. Earth, heaven, and the 144,000. A very central belief to the Jehovah's Witness religion is this matter of heaven, earth, and the 144,000. The Bible teaches, and so we believe, that when the believer dies, he is absent from the body and present with the Lord. The Bible teaches that in the moment, in a twinkling of an eye, the dead will rise and those that are alive and remain will be caught up with them and will meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Though Jehovah's Witness religion believes something very, very different. The JWs believe that there are 144,000 faithful saints that will go to heaven when they die. The rest of the believers who are not included in this number, which was sealed in the uh, 1930s, according to Jehovah's Witnesses. That's when the 144,000 ended. So anybody not included in that number will not go to heaven when they a state of sleep. They will remain in this unconscious state until resurrection. That's what the Jehovah's Witnesses believe. They believe that the 144,000 will spend eternity reigning as kings and priests while the rest of the righteous will inherit the earth. So if you ever talk to a Jehovah's Witness, they will very quickly say that you're not going to heaven when you die, I'm not going to heaven when I die, we'll be on the earth when we die. And they make a big to-do about this, and it's a big central part of their doctrine. And the 144,000 of these special people, they're the only ones that get to go to heaven. While the Bible doesn't talk much of our eternity, other than the fact that we'll be with Christ, we do know that a number of the claims of the Jehovah's Witness are contrary to Scripture. Look at Revelation chapter 7. Let's start with 144,000, please. Revelation 7. Look at verse 1. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty-four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. 
And it goes on of Judah, 12,000, Reuben, 12,000, Gad, 12,000, Asher, 12,000, Naphtalim, 12,000, so on and so forth through verse number 8. So, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that these 104,000 are saints taken from the day of Pentecost until the 1930s. In the 1930s, this number was fulfilled. We believe in taking the Bible literally unless it is specifically says otherwise. Okay, there are some places in the Bible where it's allegorical or metaphorical or, or pictorial or it's, there are areas that are not to be taken literally. However, there is nothing in this passage that should make us think that this 144,000 is anything other than literally 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each tribe that will be sealed during the time of the Great Tribulation. Nothing in this passage indicates that this is uh, uh, people upon the earth, certainly not Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, it's going to happen during the tribulation, and there will be 144,000, and they will all be Jews. There's only one other place where this number shows up. Look at Revelation 14. If you read this in the last and say, why would somebody build an entire doctrine based on two passages of Scripture that are very clear, really, that they're, they're not talking about the church age at all? Look at Revelation 14, verse number 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount of Zion with him in 144,000, having his father's name written in their forehead. So obviously that's talking about the same number as Revelation 7. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song, but 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. Look at verse 4. These are they which were not defiled with women. So these are men, right? For they are virgins. Okay. So these are they which follow the Lamb with their server. You go with these first. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Here's the thing. The Bible says that there will be 144,000 sealed, but they will be very specifically Jews. Revelation chapter number 7. They will be male, Revelation chapter number 14, and they will be virgins, Revelation chapter number 14. So if you are not a male virgin Jew during the Great Tribulation, you are not part of the 144,000. And there have been many people who have claimed to be a part of that number or people that they claim to be a part of that number of 144,000 who are not male virgin Jews and definitely not during the Great Tribulation. So their whole doctrine surrounding the 144,000 is inaccurate and unbiblical. Now, how about the other believers not going to heaven? Jehovah's Witnesses believe that you aren't in the 144,000. You don't go to heaven at all when you die or at any point. You'll inherit the earth. Some Bible verses that refute this. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This is really the only one we've got to go to. I'll read you a couple more, but let's just go to this one because this really seals the deal right here. Well, it is at this point in our lecture that the uh, poor little battery of the microphone we were trying to use could not keep up with the long-winded preacher and decided to give up the ghost. So I am now going back and adding to this and getting you the last bit of material uh, that you'll need for this, for this sermon, for this lesson. Um, so it died when we were talking about other believers not going to heaven according to the Jehovah's Witnesses. The Jehovah's Witnesses believe that the 144,000 will go to heaven when they die. Those 144,000 are made up of um, the most faithful and carefully selected Jehovah's Witnesses from the day of Pentecost up until sometime in the 1930s. Um, according to the Bible, the 144,000 are male virgin Jews that are sealed during the Great Tribulation. Now, the question is, what happens to those who, according to Jehovah's Witnesses, what happened to those who die in faith but aren't in the number of the 144,000? Well, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that if you aren't in the 144,000, you will not go to heaven. At any point, you will inherit the earth. Um, they take a few verses out of the book of Psalms that say the righteous shall inherit the land, and the New World Translation says the righteous shall inherit the earth and say that that means that you'll never get to go to heaven when you die. Let's look at a few Bible verses that refute their general idea. Look at 2 Corinthians 8. I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Come to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 with me. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, and let's look at verse number 8. 2 Corinthians 5, 8 says, We are confident, I say, and willing rather 
to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. For the believer, the born-again believer in Jesus Christ, our hope is not that we'll die and remain in a state of soul sleep like the Jehovah's Witnesses believe. It's not that we'll die and remain unconscious to the world until the end of the millennium when Jesus Christ resurrects us like the Jehovah's Witnesses believe. Our hope is that when you die, if I were, if I were to die right now, if I were to drop dead right now, my body would remain here, but I, myself, my soul, would be absent from my body and yet present with the Lord. And, as we know, the Lord currently is dwelling in the third heaven, and so if I were to leave my body right now, if I were to pass away, if I were to die, I'd be absent from my body, I'd be present with the Lord in the third heaven according to the scriptures. There's, there's nothing in the Bible that refutes that, there's nothing in the Bible that goes against that, there's nothing in the Bible that supports the idea that I'd be anywhere else but with Jesus Christ immediately and for all eternity. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 14 says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and I hope you believe that, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now we know First Thessalonians 4 is talking about the return of Jesus Christ, and it's talking about the rapture of the saints, the dead in Christ uh, rising first, and then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Okay, but the Bible says in this passage that them which sleep in Jesus... These would be the people who die prior to that rapture spoken of in the following verses. So those that are already dead, who are sleeping, but they are in Christ. They are, they are born again. They're saved. And so the Bible says that God will bring them with him when he returns to the earth. So if you can picture it in your mind, you have Jesus Christ returning, Jesus Christ coming back for his saints in the rapture. And the Bible says, as he's coming back, he's bringing the dead in Christ with him. That means they were, they were with him from where he's coming and where he's coming from is heaven. Okay, and then Philippians 1.23 says, For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. In Philippians uh, chapter 1 and verse 23, Paul is speaking about the... the, uh, the Oh, what's the word? The dilemma. He's speaking of the dilemma of really every Christian. We want to remain on the earth and we want to be a blessing to people and we want to be helpful to people and we want to fulfill the, the commission that God has given us and do the work that God has given us to do. But at the same time, there's this constant longing and the longing is, is, not, to, is not to die and remain in a state of unconsciousness. The longing is to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better and proves to us the fact that when the believer departs in death, they immediately go to be with Jesus Christ. That was Paul's hope, and that's mine as well. Now, as far as where you will spend eternity after the millennium, the Bible does indicate that the earth will be included in that. But one thing that we know is that we will be with Jesus forever, because the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I know from the moment I die, or from the moment I am raptured, I will be with Jesus Christ forever from that point forward. If he's in heaven, I'll be with him in heaven. If he's on the earth... I'll be with him on the earth. When he returns in his visible second coming, second advent to set up his kingdom upon the earth, I'll return with him. As he rules and reigns for a thousand years upon the earth, I'll rule and reign with Jesus Christ. I'll be there with him. When there's a new heaven and a new earth and all things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new, and God sets up eternity uh, whether that's in heaven, whether that's on earth, some people suggest that there might be some movement between the two possible. I know that I'll be with Jesus Christ forever. Come to Revelation 21. Look at Revelation 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. So this is post millennium. This is after the millennium. This is the old, heaven and earth have been you know, destroyed, passed away, fled away. And now there's a new heaven and a new earth. Okay, now this is where, you know, you start asking questions where, where will we be? We'll be with Christ. And we see that right here. 
I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from heaven out of uh, coming out down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. So we see clearly that we'll be with God, Jesus, throughout all eternity. And what a blessing that'll be. Okay, so that's concerning the earth. And again, that's, that's going to be a very central doctrine of Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, it seems that most of the time when I've spoken to them, they kind of open up either with that 144,000 or they open up speaking about the earth um, as opposed to heaven. So let's talk about salvation according to the Jehovah's Witnesses doctrine. What do they believe about salvation? We know that salvation is trusting in Jesus Christ in the moment that you believe in his sacrifice on the cross. You believe that he died for your sins. He was buried and rose again the third day. Uh, and you put your faith in him to save you instead of trusting your own works, we know that immediately salvation takes place. Your sins are washed away. Your sins are forgiven. They're lost in the sea of God's forgetfulness, never to return, never to be found out, never to be applied to you again. Any future sins that you might commit after that point, the Bible says in Romans 4, that blessed is he uh, to whom God doth not impute iniquity. I know that Jesus Christ's righteousness has been imputed to my soul and that my sins are no longer imputed to me. And so that's salvation According to the Bible, it can't be determined upon anything that I've done or it can't be kept by anything that I continue to do. That's what the scriptures say. And we know that, but the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, teach something differently. The Jehovah's Witnesses believe in a works-based salvation like all religions. Um, and it's very similar the way they word it, the way they describe it. It seems to be very similar to Catholicism. And what I mean by that is not necessarily that their doctrines are the same, but the Jehovah's Witness will say that salvation is only by grace and by believing on Jesus Christ, but in order to access that grace or in order to have that sacrifice sort of applied or activated in your life, you need to live by certain good works. And so it's the all too common, well, it's by grace, but works gain us grace. And that's just foolishness because the Bible says that if it's by works, then it's not grace. And if it were by grace, then it's not by works. The Bible anticipates, I believe it's Romans chapter number four, the Bible anticipates this, this false idea that somehow you can earn grace. And so many of these cults and false religions want to say that you can, it, it is by grace, but you must earn that grace. And the Bible makes it very, very clear that there's no way, if it's by grace, it's not by works. And if it's by works, it's not by grace. So here's a quote from the Jehovah's Witness um, website, jw.org. To gain salvation, you must exercise faith in Jesus and demonstrate that faith by obeying his commands. Did you get that? You must exercise faith in Jesus and demonstrate that faith by obeying his commands. The question that I would have is what command specifically? Are you saying if a person doesn't obey every single commandment of God, then they can't be saved? If that's the case, who then can be saved? Nobody. Nobody. Salvation, the only way that salvation is possible for mankind is if it's solely by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way that salvation is possible for anybody is by the grace of God. And if there's something that you think you can do to have it activated or deserved or imputed to you other than simple belief, then we're all lost. The Bible shows that you must have works or acts of obedience. This is Jehovah's Witnesses, quote, The Bible shows that you must have works or acts of obedience to prove that your faith is alive. However, this does not mean that you can earn your salvation. Yes, it does. It is God's gift based on his undeserved kindness or grace. So that's a Jehovah's Witness Quote, here's from another Jehovah's Witness website, the uh, Watchtower Online Library. So then, what is required for salvation? The prime requirement is the one that the Apostle Paul stated to the Philippian jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will get saved. Heartfelt acceptance of the shed blood of Jesus is essential if we are going to be saved. And what will salvation mean for us? Jesus indicated the answer when he said, I will give them everlasting life and they will no means ever be destroyed. Uh, so on and so forth. Let's see. Next paragraph says, Some suggest that belief in Jesus is the end of the matter. There is just one thing that anyone needs to do to get to heaven, says one religious tract. That is to accept Jesus Christ as his personal Savior, surrender him as Lord and Master, and openly confess him as such before the world. Thus, many believe that a sudden emotional 
uh, conversion experience is all we need in order to guarantee everlasting life. Well, no, that's not what we believe. We believe true faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is all that you need to be given everlasting life as a free gift because Romans chapter number four and, oh, I don't know, the rest of the New Testament seem to indicate or rather clearly say that if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. And say that if you put faith in Jesus Christ, your faith is counted for righteousness. Okay? Um, here's a, another paragraph from the same article. Yes, believing in Jesus is crucial to our salvation, but more is needed. And that is basically sums up religion and sums up the Jehovah's Witness cult. That Jesus is essential, but we think you need more than that. And I just like to take the stand that the Bible says and says that, say that the blood of Jesus Christ is sufficient and that no more is needed. Okay. Um, I think that's all we need from that, from that article. Baptism uh, is included in the works needed for salvation. So they are a religion that believes that baptism is necessary for your salvation because in order to keep the commandments of God, you need to be baptized. I do believe baptism is something that is necessary, but not for salvation. We do believe that baptism is something that, that the Lord gave to us and commanded of us and something that is something that you ought to do but certainly not something that's needed for salvation anywhere in the scripture. Eternal security. Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe in eternal security, but believe that you can lose your salvation by returning to sin and returning to unbelief. Here's their proof for that. Imagine being rescued from a burning tower. Think of the relief you would feel as you were safely taken from the building and the rescuer said, you are safe now. Yes, you would have been saved from certain death, but what would happen if you decided to go back into the building for some foolish reason? Your life would again be in danger. Here's the problem with this. You can't just randomly pull things from the world around you. You can't create your own imaginary situation and say, because you wouldn't be saved in my own imaginary situation, then you must not be saved eternally according to the Bible. Because you could return to a burning building or return to a, uh, an ocean in which you were sinking that must mean that you could return to your lost condition. You, you can't just create these fictitious situations and say, because this is true, then it must be true of your salvation as well. Anybody could do that. You can make anything true if you just pull situations from around you and say, well, this must be true because you can be saved from a burning building and then go back into the building. It must be that you could be saved from hell and go back into hell. I, I could I could make up any. OK, what if? What if you're saved from the burning building and then they put out the fire and then they, they bulldoze the dangerous building and make it a very safe place again? Well, now you can't return to the burning building. See, you can just create whatever situation you want. That's not how we get truth. We don't get truth from looking at the world around us and applying it to spiritual things. We get truth from looking at what the Bible says and applying to the Bible uh, to, to our lives and to our doctrine. Here's the remainder of the quote from the Jehovah's Witnesses. Christians are in a safe condition. They have the prospect of everlasting life because they are in a approved uh, position before God. I don't have the prospect of everlasting life. I have everlasting life as a current possession, which I cannot lose because I have Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is eternal life, according to the Bible. As a group, their salvation from Adamic sin and all its consequences is sure, but individually they will be saved to eternal life only if they continue to adhere to all of God's requirements. It would be very easy to take a Bible and show a Jehovah's Witness that they are lost because according to their doctrine, they are only saved if they adhere to all of God's requirements and there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Paul himself in Romans chapter number 7 as a saved man says that in his flesh there dwelleth no good thing and admits that he commits sin in his life. Okay, so according to their doctrine, no one can be saved and uh, it's very, very unbiblical. But that's really not concerning to a Jehovah's Witness. And the reason why it's not concerning is because the Jehovah's Witness doesn't believe in hell. I wouldn't be too concerned about my eternal salvation if there was no such thing as hell. Obviously, I want to be with Jesus Christ for all eternity. But, but if the worst possible situation is that I'd just be unconscious in a state of soul sleep forever, well, I mean, that's not, that's not, the, not too bad. 
So Jehovah's Witnesses probably aren't concerned about their loss of salvation or their work for salvation because they know if they fall short, then then at the very worst they'll just be uh, annihilated. They'll just be in a in a in a situation where they believe that they'll just be unconscious to the world around them for all eternity. Soul sleep is what they call it. They claim that all the verses that say hell are actually just references to the grave, the literal dirt grave. They'd be better translated as grave and not hell. All that you need to refute this false teaching is a Bible and a faith in what the scripture says. Matthew 18, 9 says, If thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. We know Luke 16. I'm going to turn there and read a few verses for you. Luke chapter number 16. There was a certain rich man, verse 19, which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man or the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell... He lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. So this rich man dies, and he's not in soul sleep. He's not unconscious. He doesn't cease to exist. He dies, and he wakes up in hell. And the Bible says when he wakes up in hell, he's not just separated from God. He's not just in a different place. He's not just... Uh, on his own, he's not sleeping or unconscious for all eternity. He wakes up in hell, and hell is a place of torment. Now, what are the torments? Other religions have many ideas about torment in eternity, but the Bible says, look in verse number 24. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip uh, the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame hell is a literal place with literal fire where people literally go now the jehovah's witness will look at this and say that it's a parable there's a couple reasons that i'm i'm quite certain it's not a parable one the vast majority of parables clearly state that they're a parable by their context most of them start with and he spake a parable unto them saying and goes on to say the parable either that or it's very very clear that it's a parable according to the context Um, this has no such statement and no such clarification In this uh, story, Lazarus is named specifically. No other parable has somebody given a name. I believe this is a true story about a man named Lazarus. He's given that name. I believe he's in heaven now, and the rich man is currently still burning in hell. Um, Another question for those that would believe this is a parable is, if it is a parable, what does this parable teach? The purpose of a parable and the reason that Jesus spoke in parables was to teach a very specific truth, and all his parables had a point. And so what is the point of this parable? If it is a parable, then this parable would have to teach that there is a place called hell that is a literal flame that you could go to, and you should do everything you can to avoid it. That is the teaching of the parable, if it is a parable, which I strongly doubt. Look at Ezekiel chapter number 20. This is a good verse for those who believe that such truths are are parables. The Bible says in Ezekiel 20 and verse 45, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face toward the south, and drop thy word toward the south, and prophesy against the forest of the south field, and say unto the forest of the south, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will kindle a fire in thee, and it shall devour every green tree in thee, and every dry tree. So the Lord's telling Ezekiel to speak these words against these people, and he's saying, tell them about fire that I'm going to send upon the earth. In my judgment, there'll be fire. Look what it says. The flaming flame shall not be quenched, and all faces from the south to the north shall be burned therein. So God is preaching to the people about an unquenchable fire that will come as a result of his judgment. And all flesh shall see that I, the Lord, have kindled it, and it shall not be quenched twice it says it's unquenchable fire probably speaking of hellfire verse 49 then said i ah lord god they say of me doth he not speak parables 
Ezekiel went and spoke about an unquenchable fire coming from God because of his judgment. And the people said, he's not talking about real fire. He's talking about a parable. He's not actually telling the truth. He's telling us a story. He's speaking in a parable. And then one day they saw that fire and realized it wasn't a parable at all. It was exactly what God said and exactly what God meant. I just think it's interesting. There's a passage in Ezekiel talking about fire as the judgment of God and people think it's a parable. And that's exactly what's happening nowadays when we speak about hell. Revelation 20 obviously speaks about uh, the dead and the dead being judged and those whose names are not found in the Lamb's Book of Life were cast into a lake of fire and brimstone and stayed there for all eternity. Second Thessalonians 1, 7, uh, 1 verse 7 through 9 says that, uh, And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Okay, so that's what they believe about hell and what we believe about hell, or rather what the Bible teaches on hell. Now let's finish with this, other teachings. There's a number of other teachings that are unique to the Jehovah's Witness religion uh, that you should be aware of. We won't spend a great deal of time with them. But should you hear somebody talk about them or maybe be witnessing to a Jehovah's Witness and they bring them up, uh, you won't be totally unfamiliar with these ideas. Number one, Jesus is Michael the Archangel. They believe prior to his um, manifestation in the flesh that Jesus was Michael the Archangel and he came to this earth, uh, lived in a body of flesh, and then after he died that he uh, went back to heaven to be Michael the Archangel again. Um, very, very easily refuted just by looking at verses that talk about Michael, his characteristics, his actions and verses that talk about Jesus and his characteristics and his actions. Of course, it requires a belief in the Bible, which is something that many Jehovah's Witnesses struggle with, but it's very, very clear, according to the Scriptures, that Jesus is not Michael the Archangel. Obviously, you shouldn't have to say that, but, but you do. Number two, Jesus didn't die on a cross, but on an upright torture stake. The Jehovah's Witnesses go to the original languages and say that they don't support the idea of the cross. They believe instead of one upright member and one cross member where the hands were nailed they believe it was just one upright stake and that his hands were nailed above his head and his feet were nailed towards the bottom um you know part of me wants to say it's unconsequential that it doesn't really you know one way or the other still jesus died but then at the same time the bible says it's a cross all through your king james bible it says it's a cross so it's very important you can't have a Bible that says cross and then say, well, it wasn't actually a cross. Um, we believe the King James Bible to be inerrant, to be perfect. It's God-inspired translation. And so cross was the right word. I believe it was a cross. Look what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. So if you think the cross is foolish, then it may be an indication that you're perishing. Those who would say it wasn't a cross may be an indication that you're in a state of perishing. You need to get saved and trust in that cross, or rather trust in the one who died upon the cross. The uh, Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Galatians 3.13 refutes the idea of a cross, but that a torture stake, uh, but rather a torture stake is no more consistent with Galatians 3 is what we're trying to say. Galatians 3 says that Jesus Christ was made a curse for us, uh, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. And I see, say, since that verse says tree, then it couldn't be a cross. But a stake is no more consistent with a tree than a cross is with a tree. And in fact, a cross might be more consistent with a tree given the fact that it's, it's spread out with the cross members. And so that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, Luke 23, verse 33 says, When they were come to the place which is called Calvary, they... Uh, there they crucified him, and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Okay, so the Bible says that there were people on his right hand, on his left hand, which gives you the picture, gives you the idea that his hands were probably spread out. Now, I suppose it could be just talking about the right hand side or the left hand side, but it says at his right hand and at his left hand, certainly an indication, not a bad thought that it could be speaking about the fact that his hands were spread um, also, the Bible says that Pilate, if you remember, Pilate hung a sign over the head of Jesus Christ that said he is king of the Jews. And that seems like that would fit the shape of a cross more so than a stake. 
Historically speaking, it's also safe to assume that it was a cross and not a stake, since that's usually what the Romans used to crucify people. Stakes were used at times, but most often it was the cro a cross, uh, like you see the cross and picture the cross. So this doctrine of the cross being a torture stake was created in the 1930s with no specific reason other than just to be unique and different from other denominations and from true Christianity. Number three, Jesus did not resurrect bodily, but spiritually. This is absolutely 100% false, according to the Bible. Jesus rose in a bodily resurrection. Um, you could cite John 20. Let's go there. John 20 and verse 25. John 20, verse 25 says, and the other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger in the print of the nails, and thrust my hand in his side, I will not believe. This is doubting Thomas. And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. And reach hither thy head and thrust it into my side and be not faithless, but believing. So Jesus shows up and he's got nail prints in his hands and he's got a hole in his side where the spear went in. How are you going to say that's not his body? How are you going to say this was a spirit resurrection? They believe that it was a spirit resurrection and that his body was somehow consumed or disappeared because that he could not see, let his Holy One see corruption. No, it was a bodily resurrection. He didn't see corruption because he rose from the dead bodily. Luke 24, verses 36 through 40 read, And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, you see what it says? Supposed that they had seen a spirit. They thought they had seen a spirit, but they were incorrect. He said unto them, Why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself praise the lord handle me and see me so he said look at the holes in my hands look at the holes in my feet it's really me it's the same person and the same body that was nailed to that cross i'm here it is i it's me my i myself handle me see me for a spirit look how could you believe that it was a spirit resurrection and not a body resurrection for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have and when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. He said, look at my flesh, look at my bones, look at my wounds. It's me, same Jesus, in the same body. Praise the Lord. Acts one eleven says, which also said, oh, these disciples just watched Jesus ascend into heaven. Some angels show up and say, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go in heaven. The same Jesus that left the earth and went into heaven is the same Jesus that's in heaven and the same Jesus that will return to heaven in that same body, Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. What a, what a, what a blessed truth and what an obvious truth according to the Bible. Uh, it blows my mind that anybody could say otherwise. The Jehovah's Witnesses deny the personality of the Spirit and defy him as an, define him as an active force. This is number four. They deny the personality of the Holy Spirit and define him as an active force. Um, the Holy Spirit is a person, just like the Father is a person, and just like Jesus the Son is a person. The Holy Spirit is a unique yet uh, unified person, member of the Trinity, and lives within me, and if you're saved, lives within you. Number five, the Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe in blood transfusions. Because the Bible says that uh, the life of the flesh is in the blood and that multiple places in the scripture command against the eating of blood. They believe that it's wrong to receive blood. The problem with that is it's, it's not eating blood. You're, you're not eating anybody's blood when you get a blood transfusion. Okay? And it's human blood, so it's not like you're, it's not anything that you eat. It's a medical procedure and praise the Lord that people have found out how to do such amazing things there's nothing that i can see wrong with it according to the scripture and if you have that conviction then okay fine hold to that conviction but it's not a biblical conviction number six they don't have any politi political um involvement which you know maybe not 
maybe not necessarily a bad thing, though I, I personally don't see anything in the scripture that says that you can't um, that you can't be involved politically. It's become a snare to many of the brethren, but I believe that it's a good thing to vote for those and and uh, support those who would best align with biblical truth and who would best allow us to remain in a peaceable uh, and free environment so that we can spread the gospel even further. The Bible does say you ha should have a certain level of political move involvement and that you ought to pray for your leaders. And I believe that includes praying for who your leaders will be and also pray for your current leader that they get saved if they're not and make decisions uh, based on, on what the Bible says. And then lastly, the Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe in celebrating holidays because of mostly because of their paganism. And you know some of that's good. We agree with some of that. Um, but they take it as far as to not celebrate birthdays, not celebrate um, Thanksgiving, Fourth of July, pretty much every holiday. Um, they don't they don't participate in. So interesting, just something for you to know about them. So those are the beliefs of Jehovah's Witnesses. Hope that you'll take these things to heart, memorize these things for your test, but also for your life. And hope that the Lord will send us some Jehovah's Witnesses soon so that we may use these things that we have learned. Thank you very much for your time and happy studying.